What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to the channel. So, with all of the bowl games officially announced, set to be played, I was looking into which ones I personally find the most exciting and what ones hold the most overall intrigue to me going into bowl season. And so, I decided to make a top 10 list to cover them. So, this list will mainly be based on the matchups that I think are going to be the most interesting. Also, what storylines I find compelling going into this game, not just on-field stuff, but also if I think the game will actually be competitive. I'm not going to be putting a game on here, even if it has some intrigue off the field, if I just don't think it's going to be a good competitive game. Um, so yeah, all of those things will be sort of into my criteria, and most importantly, this is just my opinion, so don't be too crazy about it. Everybody can have an opinion, guys. It's alright. I know it's the internet, but come on. Anyway, with all that being said... Let's go ahead and start off with number 10. So, at number 10, I have Houston versus Auburn. This is a group of five versus an SEC matchup that is already super interesting out of the gate due to the narratives around those conferences between the SEC being the most dominant conference in football. Also gets a lot of SEC hate out there. There's the group of five who people say can't compete at the real level of the Power Five. Houston can come out here and get a win here. Maybe that shows that the American in particular isn't as bad as people like to make the group of five out to be. So that is already an interesting storyline, in my opinion, coming into that game. Houston also just had a really strong showing against Cincinnati. Despite losing, I think they still played better than a lot of people thought they would. And Auburn just did the same thing, actually, against Alabama, taking them to four overtimes um, with a backup quarterback on one leg. QB situation at Auburn is also very interesting to me. Is, is, you know, Bo Nix going to play? Is he coming back next year? I'd assume he is. But is he going to play? Is he going to be healthy? Is TJ Finley going to play? If he is, how healthy is he? They just fired Mike Bobo, which is an interesting decision. I can't really blame them for it. He's been a mediocre at best offensive coordinator ever since he left Georgia years and years back. And uh, I think he basically single-handedly lost the Carolina game for them. Anyway, that's another interesting thing. Who's going to call plays? What's their OC going to be like? What's the offense going to be like as a whole with the quarterback situation? And then overall, how much does this game affect the program perception of Auburn and Brian Harson if they lose to Houston in a group of five matchup there? What does that make people think about Auburn? What does that do for recruiting? There was already some word about Brian Harson being interested in the Washington job. I don't think that's going to happen. But, I mean, he's in year one at Auburn. There's already talk about him moving on. That's really not a good sign for me. There's been talks about him not being a good fit in the SEC, but then he went out and he, he had a very good Iron Bowl performance. He's got him to a bowl game. They got rid of Mike Bobo, which I think was a, sort of a necessary move. So, what you know, this could really affect the overall perception of, of Auburn as a whole. And like I said, also, Group of Five SEC intrigue here could affect the perception of the Group of Five as a whole and the SEC as a whole. Very interesting on-field matchup for me, too. I think it's going to actually be pretty competitive. Um, hopefully there's not too many opt-outs on either side here. I don't think there will be anybody super, super important going to opt out, but that's a storyline we're going to have to follow going forward. Unfortunately, sort of has become a plague on bowl season, in my opinion, with all the opt-outs. Anyway, that's number 10. So at number 9, I have Wake Forest versus Texas A&M. So to me, the entry here is Wake wielding their dominant offense with very little, if any, defense, as opposed to Texas A&M, which has a fairly high-level defense and a decent offense. Um, it's an ACC-SEC matchup. Those are always interesting. There's always a lot of hate going back and forth between those two conferences. Um, so that'll be an interesting storyline to follow just as a whole. There's always the competition between all the conferences on who wins what bowl games, who wins the most, who sends the most teams, who has the best win percentage. Stuff like that. It's always an interesting thing to follow there. Um, but really, Wake is just a fun watch as a whole. Watching their offense go to work is really exciting, but at the same time, they gave up 56 points to Army. So what does that mean here? But also for Texas A&M here, the perception around the program is interesting to me because the perception coming into this year was pretty good, pretty well respected, but not quite, you know, not quite where you want it to be. Um, and then they come out, they start pretty slow, they barely beat Colorado, they lose a game to Arkansas that a lot of people think they should have won, and and that is that is sort of started them off to a bad start. They came out with two early losses, and then they go and they upset Alabama, and that really shifts perception again, and then they lose two more games. 
So the perception there is up and down, up and down, up and down. You never really know where they are. Then recruiting started to turn very good, helping Jimbo Fisher out. They land Walter Nolan. They landed another top 100 player that same day. So perception started to swing up again. But then if they come out, they lose to a Wake Forest, lose their bowl game. Where are they at at that point? They're paying Jimbo a lot of money, a lot of movement around the ACC right now, just a lot of intrigue around their program and how this game affects them. Also, how into this game is A&M really going to be? I expect Wake to actually be pretty into this game. It's kind of a rare spot for them to be in. But for A&M, how much do they really care about this game? How many opt-outs do you have? Does Marvin Leal opt out? Other A&M players, how many do them opt out? I don't expect Wake to have many opt-outs. Um, so that'll be another interesting storyline to watch. But yeah, that is number nine for me. At number eight, I have Michigan State versus Pitt, the old Pitt Panthers there. To me, the big entry here is the Mel Tucker factor. He's somebody I've followed ever since he left Georgia. But he has been, in my opinion, a very good head coach. Some people hated his hire at Michigan State. They thought it was a very premature decision on a coach that hasn't been all that impressive at his, at his previous stops. And then he got there and he turned them around immediately. Their over over their over under on wins coming into this year was four, and he got them to where they are now, which is incredible. Got them to a New Year's Six bowl, beat Michigan in comeback fashion. I have a or well, he was a potential Heisman candidate. He's not going to make it to New York, but Kenneth Walker had an outstanding season all the way around. The big thing is, you know, their their pass defense is arguably the worst in all of in all of college football. It's it's horrendous, but. The Mel Tucker thing, then he gets that big extension, and then he comes out and he gets blasted by Ohio State, and people are making fun of them for the extension, but then he comes out and he beats Penn State in a game where Penn State was favored, and it's just it's just very interesting little roller coaster ride we've had there with Mel Tucker, so that always adds intrigue to me to the bowl game when there's big coaching intrigue. There's also some Kenny Pickett interest to me. Because he's a guy who could opt out for high NFL draft stuff, but he could choose to play against a very good Michigan State team to try to make a a you know a big statement game heading into the heading into the draft season. That could be very interesting. I also enjoy watching Kenny Pickett play. It's a very interesting um, matchup there. Also, you get ACC versus Big Ten. Like I said, with the with the Wake Forest A&M game, always interesting to see the Big Power Five conferences go up against each other. There's always competition there. And these are really two up-and-coming programs nobody thought would be here. Michigan State and Pitt, mainly Michigan State, um, you know, what, nobody thought Pitt was going to win the ACC. Nobody thought Michigan State was going to make a New Year's Six Bowl. It's really exciting to see both of them pitted against each other, two sort of new bloods in the... Um, big-time college football conversation, at least as of late. So I think that is also very interesting. You also have Kenny Pickett, who's a Heisman finalist, matching up against Kenneth Walker, who some people may argue was a Heisman snub. I don't think he was a snub, but still, that's some intrigue there. And then also, though, Kenny Pickett has a chance to have a really big game if he plays against a very bad Michigan State pass defense. Could get ugly quick, but it could also... Maybe, you know, put some, some, some draft stock out there on Kenny Pickett. Maybe if he doesn't perform as well or, you know, just, just interesting things there with, with the Pitt program with Pickett and the Michigan State program mainly with Mel Tucker. So a lot of intrigue in this game for me, and that's number eight. So at number seven, I have Clemson versus Iowa State. Now the big thing here is the coaching intrigue. It looms large. Dabo is having some issues in Clemson. Obviously, we know they're having a down year. They're still ranked in the top 20, but very big down year in a year that they really weren't expected to. Very unhappy Clemson fan base. Been some some criticism of Dabo there, in particular with his opinions on the portal. Um, he also got some heat sort of off the field stuff over the past year or two, and so so that's interesting there. Following the Dabo Sweeney saga. And then also, both of these teams have really had disappointing seasons for what they were expected to do preseason, um, which is an interesting thing how, how similar they can be, similar to how Michigan State and Pitt were both on the, on the rise, kind of up and coming. These two are kind of doing the opposite thing. And then similar to the Dabo coaching issues, Brent Venables is gone. What does that do? What does that mean for the program? This will be our first look at that. Does the defense take a big drop off? What does the perception of the program do? 
how locked into this game is Clemson. Lots of interesting things there. And then Iowa State has a lot of that same stuff on their own side. There's some talk that Matt Campbell's checked out, that he doesn't want to be here. He kind of thought he was going to get another job. Does he have another job? Is he looking for a new job? By the time they play this game, he may not even be there. At the time of this recording, he is. If he is still there, is it a Dan Mullen situation where a lot of people think Dan Mullen thought he was going to get to leave Florida last year, and then he didn't, and he kind of lost his team because of it coming in this year? How much of that's going to come in there? Just so much coaching intrigue, both at the head coach and the coordinator level here. Also, we're going to get to see two great defenses go at it. Offensive that have sputtered this season despite both having talent. Are you going to see any opt-outs from DJ, uh, not DJU, but from from Iowa State, um, from, from Clemson? They've already got some people in the portal. So just some, some interesting intrigue there on the player side. But most of the intrigue here for me is both coaching staffs and sort of the trajectories of the program as a whole. So for number six, I have Penn State and Arkansas. The Big Ten SEC factor is huge here for me. Um, Two proud programs in their respective conferences. Big Ten SEC are the two best conferences in America right now. Everybody feels that way. Big Ten hates on the SEC. The SEC hates on the Big Ten. It's always an interesting little matchup there. And uh, at least down here in SEC country, we, we always love to get a good Big Ten matchup. The Penn State-Auburn game earlier this year was a great one to watch. This one could be similar. I think Arkansas is a better team than Auburn. Um, And Penn State beat Auburn by eight, but they were at home with the wideout. So this will be a neutral field. Could be interesting to see. But really, they're two programs seemingly going in opposite directions. Penn State has been really struggling as of late. Past few seasons haven't been as good as they've been hoping for. There have been countless talks. Every time a job opening comes up, it's James Franklin's going to go there. James Franklin might go here. James Franklin's going to leave Penn State. And then he signed an extension, and it's kind of been quiet since then. But there's still, I feel like there's still some uneasiness there. There's still some intrigue around that program with the coaching situation. Is Penn State happy with with Franklin? Is Franklin happy with Penn State? Super interesting. And then on the other side, you have Sam Pittman, who's the exact opposite. He's a potential coach of the year. He has a bottom feeder program in the SEC looking dangerous. They're on the rise. They're up. They're making a big-time bowl game, getting a big shot here. All the momentum is going their way. You know, does Penn State come in here really unmotivated versus Arkansas being super motivated? Um, does Penn State come in here looking to shock the world? I, I don't know. It's it's a very interesting matchup for me for a lot of the narratives around the coaching staffs and the trajectories of the program as Penn State seems to be kind of going down, down, down. Arkansas seems to be going up, up, up. Um, there could be some recruiting implications here, mainly for Arkansas, I feel like. A big statement bowl win could really help carry their momentum into the offseason. Which goes hand-in-hand with, like I was saying earlier, the overall program trends are super interesting here to me. And that is why I've got that one at number six. So for number five, I have Ohio State versus Utah. The stylistic matchup to me is super interesting. Utah is more of a run-based offense that can throw with a pretty high-level defense. And they're going up against a super powerful Ohio State passing attack that can also run the ball very well, but have kind of a rough defense. But that could be kind of flipped on its head because the opt-outs here, you know, I don't know. Olave and Garrett Wilson might both play. But both of them could opt out. And Smith and Jigba, I guess, could probably also opt out and try to go pro, which could really help see how good C.J. Stroud is really. Could also see the the youth in the Ohio State receiver room. Get us a glimpse into the future of that program. Might make them lean a little more on the ground which with Trayvon Henderson, they look like they've got a, a elite running back there for the next few years. That'll be an interesting matchup to see. Utah has all the momentum right now. They're coming off two massive wins over Oregon, Pac-12 title. They're looking up and up, but are they good enough to really fight with the big boys and fight with Ohio State? Is Ohio State going to be locked into this game? So much interesting things there. How good is Utah really? Is the Pac-12 really just really bad? Oregon beat Ohio State. Utah blew out Oregon twice. Does that mean Utah's better? I don't know. I don't know. That's why I'm so interested in this game. There's so much that we aren't sure of. Also, it's just it's nice to see two coaches in, in Whittingham and Ryan Day who are staying put. Now, Ryan Day, I mean, you're at Ohio State. Where else are you going to go that's a better job than Ohio State? 
But Whittingham at Utah has been offered multiple jobs, and he's decided he's staying where he is. He's going to try to build that program up. Very interesting thing there. Kind of refreshing to see in today's world. But anyway, lots of entering there, and that's why I have them at number five. So for number four, we have Oregon and Oklahoma. Coaching is a major, major factor here. Who's going to be coaching either team this game? Is Venables already coaching for Oklahoma? Who's Oregon's coach going to be? Cristobal's gone now. We don't know who they're going to have. Who's their interim going to be? Who's their long-term going to be? No idea. Um, Does this game mean anything for the trajectory of either program under their new coaches, respectively? Um, I think that goes hand in hand with who's going to be coaching the game. But if Oklahoma, for example, comes out and you know plays horrible, does that sort of just compound the Lincoln Riley leaving factor and losing a lot of their big recruits? Um, does the opposite happen? Is Oregon a program who's really kind of slumped? They were looking good with Cristobal. They beat Ohio State, then they lost to Stanford. They got blown up by Utah twice. They're in a very weak conference, and they have out-recruited everybody else in that conference, and they've done nothing with it. Now they've lost their head coach. Where do they go from here? Could be a real blue blood program that could just be on the ropes. We have no idea where they're going, and Oklahoma's not too different from that either. you got a brand-new head coach in Venables. There, there's just so much intrigue around the coaching there. Uh, the overall trajectory of the program is also very interesting because we just don't know. We have no idea where they're going to end up. Oklahoma's heading to the SEC soon. So much interesting stuff there. There's definitely potential recruiting implications in play with with Oregon. We don't know what's going to happen with their class with Cristobal leaving. Oklahoma's class is in shambles right now. Can Venables get it together? Does this bowl game have any impact on future recruiting? A lot of interesting things there. And the, both of these programs who had what were seen as stable and elite-level coaches coming into the season, both of them left them this year. Um... Lincoln Riley was more of a shot than Cristobal, I feel like. But still, neither one of them would have been expected to leave their programs coming into this year, and yet they're both already gone. It's just, who's going to respond better to that? There's a lot of interesting things there. Again, major coaching intrigue. I feel like there's a lot of that this year. This coaching carousel has been insane. It's been one of the craziest we've seen, and you can really see that in a lot of these bowl games that are going to be pretty interesting to see what impacts coaching can have on those. So that is why I've got that one at number four. At number three, we have Alabama and Cincinnati. Group of five team in the playoff is really all I need to say here. But also, the group of five finally makes the playoff. What's the reward? Go up against the evil empire. That is Nick Saban and Alabama. I mean, it's just, of all the teams they could have drawn, they would get Alabama. That's just how this, how this sport tends to work. After the SEC Championship game, does, does Cincy really have any hope? Um, there's going to be a lot of people who say they have no chance in this game. There's going to be a lot of people who say that Bama's overrated. There's It's super interesting for those narratives alone. How good is Cincinnati really? We don't know. We expect that Alabama's noticeably better, but that we don't really know. We have no idea. This is the first group of five in the playoff. We haven't really seen anything like this before. So much intrigue there. Can Bama put together another perfect game? I mean, they haven't. They've they played perfect basically against Georgia, but for the rest of the season, they've really struggled. Is there going to be any letdown there? Going to be any overlook? I doubt it, but you don't know. Um, Jerome Ford is a former Alabama player, so that's an interesting storyline to look at. Desmond Ritter finally is going to go up against a Heisman level quarterback. How does he stack up to that competition? That's going to be interesting. Can Cincinnati really compete with the best of the best? Is Alabama going to get another one? So much intrigue there. This is going to be a pretty, it's going to be a really, really interesting game. It might end up being a blowout. It really might. It could also be one for the ages. It could be a massive upset. I don't know. That's the whole thing. There's so much unknown in this game. It's super exciting, super interesting, and I'm sure everybody cannot wait to get into this one. And that is why we have that one at number three. For number two. I have Ole Miss and Baylor, and a lot of people would probably have Alabama and Cincinnati above this. But for me, this is super interesting because these are two programs who are both on the rise in their respective conferences, and they both have coaches with hot names on the market that have both gotten their teams much farther than expected, and yet both stayed put. Um, That's super interesting to me. Dave Aranda is climbing. He was, you know, a candidate for the for the USC job, candidate for the LSU job. 
Lane Kiffin got mentioned at USC. He got mentioned at Oklahoma. He got mentioned at Florida. He's a super hot name. Both teams have outperformed all their expectations. Baylor won the Big 12. It's super interesting to see both teams on a high trajectory. Will Matt Corral play in this game? Because he's super exciting to watch all the time. Um, you're going to get to see a Lane Kevin offense up against a Dave Aranda defense, which is a, just a really fun thing to watch for real football people out there who just like to watch really good schematically sound football. That's super interesting. Can either of these teams eventually break into the college football playoff in a few years? Um, you know, that is something that's going to be interesting. Like I said, they're two up and coming programs. It's going to be really tough for Ole Miss because they're in the SEC West, but Baylor could, especially with potential uh weaknesses in in the uh the big 12 right now oklahoma is going to be kind of down probably texas isn't looking great right now they're both going to be leaving the conference soon super interesting there so much intrigue with the two future super bright looking coaches right now we'll see are they one year wonders super interesting for me to see them match up programs could be great going forward they could become big mainstays they could fizzle out you don't know There's so much intrigue there, and I think the actual game on the field is going to be incredibly exciting to watch. I think they're two very evenly matched teams in the second tier of college football teams right now, and uh, I think the stylistic matchup there is going to be super interesting, and that's why I have them all the way up at number two. So now for some honorable mentions, things that just didn't quite make the cut for me. You got Tennessee and Purdue. That's just going to be interesting. It's another SEC Big Ten one. You have two very high-flying passing offenses. Tennessee with a lot of up-tempo. Josh Heupel has a lot of hype around him right now. Can he carry that into a big bowl win? Interesting things there. Iowa and Kentucky, also a very interesting SEC Big Ten matchup. You get Iowa's elite defense against Kentucky, who has a pretty good offense, but a very good defense. Um, Mark Stoops has got a lot of big-name attention this year um, about potentially going other places, just signed a big extension, so that could be interesting. And then the last honorable mention, I have Notre Dame, Oklahoma State. It's a New Year's Six Bowl. They're two very good teams. You get to see Marcus Freeman his first time coaching in a in a Notre Dame, uh, or being the head coach of Notre Dame, getting in a big bowl game. Mike Gundy and Oklahoma State came inches away from winning the Big 12. They could have, I mean, they were literally inches away from having a very real shot at the playoff. Um, so that's always going to be interesting as well. I think all three of those games are going to be very interesting, just not quite as interesting as the rest of the games on this list. And so that brings us to number one, which is going to have to be Georgia versus Michigan. And in my opinion, it is the most interesting game of bowl season. Partially because, yes, I'm a Georgia fan, but really mainly just because of the matchups and the storylines on this one. Jim Harbaugh versus Kirby Smart is already super interesting on its own just between the the personalities around those coaches. They both kind of have their own little mystique around them. Very interesting coaching matchup there. Then you throw in, they had a little beef years back. Kirby sort of insinuated that Jim Harbaugh was cheating um, on the recruiting rules by holding team practice or uh, spring practices for his team in Florida to set up some camps to get some recruiting in in uh, SEC territory, which is super interesting. So they have a little history there. Then you consider Georgia opens as basically the same point spread favorites uh, in this game as they were in the SEC championship game, and we all saw how that went. So does that have any impact here? I doubt it, but it's just an interesting little storyline to follow. Then Michigan is finally, they're peaking right now. There's been all these questions around the program about Harbaugh, is he ever going to get over the hump, or you know, can he finally beat Ohio State? And he's finally answered all these questions, or has he? Because what if they come out on this big stage and they go up against an SEC team like Georgia and they just collapse? Do all these questions about Harbaugh come back? How satisfied is Michigan with him, really? And on the contrary, what if they dominate? What does that mean for Georgia, who everyone has considered this to be their best shot at a national championship that they've been so close to but never achieved since 1980? If they don't get it this year, when? When will they get it? What does that mean for them? Also, what does it mean for Harbaugh going forward? making a national championship appearance. That doesn't even touch on the matchup on the field. It is outstanding. It's going to be a hard-fought, line-of-scrimmage, physical game. Both teams are going to be beat up coming out of this one. And the impact of this game is as high as it can be. The winner goes to the championship. Both programs have a lot of questions surrounding them right now. Both coaches are in need of another big win. Honestly, I'd say Kirby more than Harbaugh right now is in need of a big win. 
and and the future implications of this game could literally shape the landscape of college football for years or even decades to come. If Georgia finally breaks through, gets to the national championship, and they win there, that could completely shift the landscape of football and recruiting in the SEC even more than it already has. If the opposite happens, Georgia could go the opposite way, which would also shift the landscape of football. If Michigan gets a national championship out of this, what does that mean for them? Does that mean they start to take over some of Ohio State's dominance? There's so much that could happen in this game with the programs, with the -the on-the-field matchup, the players, the playoff, the coaches. There's so much. And if all of that doesn't make it the number one bowl game, I don't know what will for you. To me, this is far and away the most interesting bowl game of bowl season. Anyway, with all of that being said, thank you guys so much for watching. If you have made it this far into the video, you are awesome. I really, really appreciate your support. And let me know down below what bowl games you're most interested in seeing this year. Also, be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and want to see more content like it in the future. Once again, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you guys in the next one.